It said that science is all about perspective. But what might appear incongruous from one point of view is perfectly rational from another. Thus the use of high-tech computers to retrieve and process ancient religious texts at the Pondicherry-based Institute of Indology is not at all surprising. Indeed, what science is doing to those texts today has, at one time, been done by religion to science itself. Creation and keeping alive. In the non-linear way in which history has spiraled in India, there's been an integral relationship between science and ritual. Seeing the elaborate religious nature of the rituals being performed at the Som Yagya today, it's difficult to imagine that it has anything to do with science. And yet, the Som Yagya of the Vedic period had much to do with chemistry, medicine, and even with mathematics. Very little is known about the name and the nature of the plant from which the Som juice was extracted. The juice itself was known to be mildly narcotic and gave a kind of a high to whoever drank it. The juice is mentioned and the plant is mentioned repeatedly in the Rig Veda. But the plant is also mentioned in the Zenda Vesta as whom. Major herbariums attached to scientific research institutions in the country and elsewhere have not yet been able to reproduce that plant. The extraction of the appropriate fluids from the Som and other plants and detailed descriptions of methods of processing them evidence considerable development of knowledge of biochemistry in those ancient times. And the modes of making exact calculations to build ritual altars makes it clear that the Vedic people had fairly advanced knowledge of mathematics, including trigonometry. Amongst the earliest texts of the Vedic times is the Sulab Sutras, which deals with uh, construction of altars of various sizes and various shapes. In the process of constructing altars or describing the ways in which the altars have to be constructed, the, the Sulab Sutra goes into very detailed knowledge of geometry. Uh, for instance, there is a, uh, a place in Sulab Sutra where they talk about uh, constructing an altar which is twice the area of a given altar and the way it says to go about it is that the cord of the original altar makes if you take that as a side of the of the new altar, then the new altar has twice the area of the original altar. Now this, as anybody can see, is the Pythagoras theorem. The refinement of mathematical knowledge continued in India even after the Vedic period, and trigonometric tables of sine, etc., and accurate values of pi were developed by Aryabhat in the 5th century AD. But mathematics was not the only discipline that developed in India. Nor was religion and ritual the only mode of the development of technology. Indeed, the evidence of kilns and altars in Harappan cities points to the development of various technologies even before the Vedic period.
There are many other aspects of the technology of the Harappan that live on in today's India. The use of weights and measures, baking of seals and symbols, working with beads and other material, all have an old technological ancestry. Technological development and the recognition of principles like those of the lever are indeed linked to development of production itself. There's evidence that the potter's craft, which too implies significant scientific knowledge, was already well established before the Harappan cities flowered. It's another matter that there's been a degree of technological stagnation since then. The Harappan bullock cart could well be in use today without exciting any comment. Agricultural implements too presumes the development of major technological skills. It's the development of agricultural technology and sciences that underlies the food stocks that fill the granaries of the Harappan cities, just as they provide food security even today. respect the gigantic harvester combines in use today are only links in the chain of agricultural technology that began with the humble plough. From the point of agriculture and production, metallurgy is arguably an important technology. humble ironsmith working on his foundry to the most sophisticated production of metal goods today, it's this metallurgical skill that is constantly being sought to be enhanced. But then metallurgy was also used for a more deadly purpose, the production of weapons. Through the centuries, craftsmen used their technical skills to produce ever more sophisticated weapons. The swords and daggers of India have legends carved into them. Access to the power of gunpowder made it necessary to devise more and more powerful guns. It's another matter that social and military organization did not keep pace with the technology of warfare in India. In 16th century and even in 17th century, it was recognized by European travelers that mounted archers of the Mughal army were a formidable force. By the end of the 17th century, they were saying that such a force could not withstand a charge of drilled European musketry. And therefore, um, a military and administrative organization, however centralized, the Mansak system, uh, 
in which the rank and the salary was dependent on cavalry, that system could not continue where the decisive force became artillery and uh, uh, musket bearing infantry. And therefore, a change had to come in the organization, but that would have entailed a very large uh, a capacity for effecting a very large change in the entire system, which the Mughals did not seem to be capable of. There are many massive cannons in different forts. They are hard to maneuver and require massive amounts of gunpowder to charge them. Indeed, such cannons were described by an Italian traveler as useless for war and serving only for vain pomp. Nevertheless, these symbols of military technology did serve their purpose to intimidate the population if in ways that were not quite anticipated. Technologies adapt with the time. These little guns mounted on the battlements of the fortified town of Pokhran are of a different type. Today, the explosions that have taken place near Pokhran are of a vastly different magnitude. But the fact is that in both cases, technology has been adapted for purposes of either offense or defense, depending on which end of the gun you are standing at. While it's understandable that military technology tended to develop only in fits and starts, it's curious that there was also major stagnation in civil technology. That too took place in a sector which has been vital to the Indian economy, the production of cotton textiles. From the Harappan urban cultures through the chronicles of Alexander's incursion into India, there is evidence of the use of cotton, the wool that grows on Indian trees, as the Greeks called it. There is also enough evidence of processing the cotton through ginning and carding. And of course there were many modes of weaving both cotton and silk. There also developed many technologies for processing of the textiles and knowledge of dyes was only one aspect of that. What's strange, however, is that there is no evidence for the existence of the spinning wheel in India prior to the early 14th century. One possible sociological explanation is that the spinning wheel was a labor-saving device which increased quantity of thread being spun but did little to improve quality. As a consequence, it was used for coarser fabrics and hand-rotated spindles and whorls could only spin the fine yarn needed for the famous Dhaka muslin. Hence, while the use of a spinning wheel brought about a six-fold increase in productivity, its adaptation was held up on account of social factors that were connected to the market for luxury goods. The charkha had to wait for centuries to find the social and political status befitting its technological utility. 
Indeed, in looking at technology in India, it's almost as important to look for factors of stagnation as modes of development. Take medical and surgical techniques for example. There's been fairly systematic knowledge in these fields ever since the Vedic period. By the 4th century AD, there were well-organized hospitals run by legendary physicians like Dhanvantri next to the Mauryan capital at Kumrar in Patna. Meanwhile, the key texts of Ayurved, the Charak Samhita and Susruta Samhita, outline many modes of the practice of medicine and surgery. They even contain detailed treatises on anatomy and physiology and descriptions of elaborate surgical instruments like these, which are preserved in scientific museums today. However, there was another aspect to the practice of medicine in India, as in the Ayurved that is used in Kerala and other parts until today. Fairly soon, however, medical practice got restricted to specific social groups. To begin with, the medical practitioners, the Vaids, were fairly respected and their social position was just below that of the Brahmins, but above that of the socially vital, the carpenters. <laughs> The Brahmin took care of the soul. The carpenter of the tools of this world. In between, the Vyads looked after the body. However, in due course, perhaps on account of the uncleanliness attributed to the profession, it passed mainly to the wandering ascetics and the roving physicians. Charan Vaids belonged mainly to the Buddhist and Jain Shamanic orders. There is evidence that medicine was an important discipline taught at this famous university of Nalanda. Still later, however, a large element of magic and superstition was added to the science of medicine. There was some revival of scientific medicine through the synthesis of Ayurveda with Yunani or Ionian Greek systems in establishments like this famous college set up by the Delhi Sultans in the 14th century. But till today, itinerant medicine men continue to practice their craft in India, tending to people in sickness and in health. On the issue of 
of life and death, the Buddha himself is said to have instructed his devoted follower, Ananda, to make a mandala like a water wheel so as to show the cycle of rebirth. The water wheel has indeed continued to turn in India for centuries. Previously, it's known as the Persian wheel. The development of irrigation technology has, in fact, been an important aspect of technological progress in India. Chandragupta Maurya and Ashok had built major tanks. Many centuries later, Firoz Shah Tughlaq had long canals dug in North India. On the other hand, the Anikat and Tank systems of South India sustained society for centuries. Step wells of Gujarat, like this one at Patan, known as Rani Ki Bhav, were both aesthetic and immensely useful. Culture that has been the strongest motor of scientific advance in India. The development of genetic resources has been an important aspect of the biotechnical knowledge pool of the people of this resource rich region. Scientists and farmers are really overlapping categories, and this is not true today. In fact, the greatest geneticists of this country and of many, many countries of the South have been the farming communities. Pause and think that it is this community that has created food and cash crops from the wild plants of the forest. Now, what greater science do you want? Apart from this kind of field science, the Indians in the Middle Ages had extremely sophisticated universities where science was taught. We knew the arts of distillation. We knew the arts of extraction of the properties of medicinal plants. We knew how to treat genetic material in an extremely scientific and sophisticated way. The scientific quest spanned the entire universe from the ground to the sky. And scientists like Aryabhat, Bhaskar, Brahmagupta, made signal contributions to the sciences of astronomy and mathematics. It's however in the fairly late astronomical instruments devised by the ruler courtier astronomer Raja Jai Singh in the 18th century that the irony of Indian astronomy is evident. Known as the Jantar Mantar, these were erected in Jaipur, Delhi, Varanasi, Ujjain and Mathura. These instruments are fairly accurate in charting these skies and were used for making comprehensive tables of the movements of the sun and the stars. The only thing was that these massive masonry observatories and instruments were built much after Copernicus and Galileo had already changed ways of looking at the stars. By then, much 
much more handy instruments had been devised for that purpose. However, in India, scientific advance in observing stellar phenomena, for instance, continued to be accompanied by superstition and eclipses are ascribed to demonic forces. When religious and administrative needs intrude on science, technology does get fossilized. And when superstition overtakes science, astronomy ends up as mere astrology. There are indeed few instances of continuity in this respect of science progressing along a straight linear path from production technology to information technology. It is not often in the fields of science and technology for the old to come together with the new. It is only in a rare place like this, Jamia Hamdar, where the ancient wisdom of medicine gathered over centuries has been combined with the new technology of computerization and the whole field of information technology. This is a very potent combination. It allows for the wisdom gathered over generations to be utilized in today's situation. But well before this, of course, technology was galloping ahead at another pace altogether, changing the face of India forever. The new juggernaut was on the move, and it would alter society, politics, economics, and the very ecology of India. But that is another story.